going on with our talk this morning, the uh, Transparency International Papua New Guinea in partnership with the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC, uh, is hosting a series of eight radio panel discussions on various topics uh, to inform voters prior to the 2022 uh, National General Elections. Now, these discussions are also being shared on TRPNG's Facebook page, and for this morning's broadcast, it is the sixth episode in the series uh, with the topic of uh, political uh, representation. We are joined in the studio by the following uh, guests, and uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, you with us this morning uh, to speak on various uh, you know, aspects of our topic this morning. And so I will introduce um, our panel for our um, program number six with TIPNG on our Building Elections Integrity Through Partnership Program. And uh, say a big good morning to Mr. Uh, Emmanuel Pock, uh, who is uh, a Director, uh, Policy and Legal Division, Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates Commission. Also <coughs> present, uh, Mr. Edward Verkic, Deputy Resident Representative with the UNDP, and uh, Mr. Yuambari Haihue, Deputy Director, Partnerships and Policy, TIPNG. Gentlemen, a big good morning to you. Thanks so much for the company as we go through another important discussion this morning. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning for to be here. All right. Uh, and so first up, our um, our talk is around uh, political representation this morning. Um, and uh, uh, before we do get into that, as always, it, it would be nice to know a little bit about yourselves, uh, um, you know, the, the, the roles and responsibilities, I should say, the type of work uh, that you do for the benefit of... Uh, uh, our listener as we move on with our conversation. So uh, maybe first up, uh, Mr. Uh, Emmanuel Parker, uh, and then over to you, Mr. Verkic. Uh, Thank you, Josephine. Um, I represent the Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates Commission, or the, uh, we call it the Registry of Political Parties, which is the administrative uh, arm of the commission. Uh, our main role is to you know, register political parties, administer political parties in accordance to the organic law on the integrity of political parties and candidates. Uh, that has been established uh, in 2001, but uh, enacted in 2003. Uh, OLIPEC, we call it. So we are a state in agency that regulates the behavior of political parties uh, in the country. Mm. Thanks for that. And uh, also uh, present Mr. Verkic mm. from uh, the UNDP. <coughs> Morning, Justin. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Uh, I'm the Deputy Resident Representative of the United Nations Development Program. UNDP is, is one of the larger UN agencies here. We're a family and proud to say we're working with both TI, Transparency International, and, and the IPPCC. It's got a lot of letters. Yeah. Um, but in summary, look, UNDP has been here since 1982. Um, we are one of the one of the pillars of the UN's development program. We work in a number of areas: climate, environment, peace building, and of course, governance and parliament. We're very proud to be leading the charge in partnership with government and our colleagues here on empowering women, particularly around elections. So it's a pleasure to be here, and certainly, uh, you know, I look forward to discussion. And lastly, uh, Mr. Ewan Barry from uh, TIPNG. Uh, thank you, Josephine, and good morning to our listeners on NBC uh, as well as on Facebook. Um, TIPNG, as you're aware, is PNG's leading anti corruption civil society organization. Our mission is really to empower people in Papua New Guinea to take action against corruption, which is the abuse of entrusted power for personal gain. Um, during this elections period, one of the roles that TIPNG is performing is to inform citizens about their rights and responsibilities as voters so that we can address corruption throughout the electoral process to make sure that we have free, fair and safe elections. Mm -hmm. So again, on behalf of TIPNG, thank you to NBC for hosting this series of discussions and to our partners from UNDP and uh, IPPCC mm -hmm. for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, our panel for this morning's talk as we will be talking around political representation uh, this morning. And now, uh, um, moving on with... Uh, uh, our conversation um, as we get into our discussion what is the uh, political definition uh, of uh, a representative um, maybe we could start with that as we lead into uh, the first bit of uh, our discussion and so i will throw it to uh, 
Mr. Emmanuel Falk from Olipat, if you could just explain to us what is the political definition um, of a representative? Thank you. Um, I think uh, in a nutshell, you know, Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea is a, a representative democracy. And uh, in a representative democracy, or representative democracy is a form of governance in which um, the people exercise their right mm. to make political decisions through, uh, through elected leaders. Uh, so with Papua New Guinea, we uh, vote uh, our representative to represent us uh, in making political decisions. So the representative representatives are obliged to act in accordance to the interests of the people. Uh, so as as opposed to uh, uh, direct uh, democracy. Mm. So yes, that's the simple definition that I can think of. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, three levels of government, the national government, provincial government, and the local level government. Okay, people can be represented at the lowest of grass, grassroots level, which is the local level government, the ward members. The, the process of electing leaders is the same. At the ward level or local level, people go to the polls, and then the electoral commission conducts the elections and they vote their leaders, okay? And at the provincial level, the same, and then at the national level. Uh, the difference is the local level is the government more closer to the people and it's more at a local setting. Uh, the provincial and uh, national level of representation carries a much bigger responsibility and as some form of uh, you know, resources attached to that responsibility. So in making decisions, you know, the provincial and uh, local level, or the provincial and the national uh, levels of government and the representation in that level should really, uh, you know, make decisions that will reflect the choices or the wishes of the people that they elect. Mm. And so who is a political representative in Papua New Guinea? How would we um, define that? Oh, well, political representatives are the people that uh, we elect. Mm. Uh, for example, the ward members, uh, the provincial governors. Uh, before 1995, we used to have provincial uh, uh, members as well. But then it has been abolished after the 1995 reforms, but now we have the national leaders, the members of parliament. So these are the representative of our people. Mr. Vokic, bringing you also into um, the conversation, um, as Mr. Pop mentioned, the process of, of uh, electing representatives you know, across the board, it's the same, whether at the, uh, the local or um, you know the uh, uh, the national level. Um, are you able to um, you know differentiate for us how a national MP is different to a local councillor? Adding on to what Mr. Yeah. Pop has has told us this morning. Josephine, thanks. Good morning to to everyone. Uh, it's a great question. I think it's worth taking a step back and and understanding that democracy is a, a beautiful but very complicated system. Mm -hmm. And I think we should. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got. And it's we shouldn't forget that the fundamental principle of democracy is is rule of the people, for the people, by the people. Mm. And I think that's a really important thing to stress. And you see it in Papua New Guinea where there is very active political life and participation. So that's a key ingredient. I think one of the things that we shouldn't forget is that democracy really is about participation, transparency and accountability, mm. particularly of those elected. Because what you're doing as a voter is you're empowering someone, as Emmanuel said, to speak on your behalf. The, Emmanuel is right, there are various levels of government in Papua New Guinea. We were talking about this on the way in, and in many respects it looks like a federal system. It doesn't quite work that way, but it has these levels of government. I think the real difference is the, the nature of the issues that are being debated. In the national parliament, you would rightly expect 
the national parliament to debate issues of national importance. Mm -hmm. So big issues around climate change and infrastructure and how the money should be spent and literacy and health and all these other things. Mm -hmm. At the local and provincial levels, those issues will become, as I think Manuel quite rightly captured, closer to the people. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the local level, it very much is about local amenities and services and what's been provided. Provincial level sits in between that. I think one of the things that we shouldn't forget, particularly in Papua New Guinea, if we come back to those principles of participation, transparency and accountability, Papua New Guinea is lagging behind the world in representation. Oh. And we don't have a broad base of representation. Uh, I've always argued that you, can, you can't expect your country to develop at 100% if only 50% of the people are represented. And we shouldn't forget that Papua New Guinea is one of only four countries in the world at the moment that has no female members of parliament. So this then becomes a question of representation. So when you talk about that, that question is not just the difference between national and local, but how do we get more voices represented, uh, which is critical. And the same can be said of youth. Uh, I think there is no one in parliament, one under the age of 30, and only six people under the age of 40. Mm. So that in itself tells you there's a problem because 60%, if I was to, um, if I was to draw on my colleagues in the in UNFPA who keep these numbers, so about 60% of Papua New Guinea's population is under the age of 25, 26. So there's, when we talk about representation, it's not just about what those elected do, it's about where they're drawn from mm. to ensure the, the most broad voice is provided. Yeah. Yes, and I think um, ju jumping in on, on that uh, train, train of thought by our esteemed panelists this morning, um, from TIPNG's point of view, this representation is also a key component of public trust. Um, so as I mentioned at, at the introductory stage, uh, corruption occurs when there's persons or people with uh, who have been entrusted with responsibility, and rather than using that trust for the benefit or following the processes that are in play, they choose to benefit only a select few of themselves, and that's where you have this corruption coming in, where a person abuses trust for personal gain. And um, this point um, raised by uh, Mr. Rutich um, around if, if we have government, it has to be of the people, by the people, for the people. This is great uh, American ideals. Another one is also uh, you shouldn't have taxation without representation. And when you have taxation, that means all of us in our communities, whether it's at the local level, national level, we pay taxes. That's public money that goes, and the representatives that we elect, as mentioned by Mr. Pope, uh, not only do they make laws and policies, they also decide where that money goes to. Uh, and one of the issues we often see is that People go in thinking that they've been mandated by only a select few people in the community to basically spend money however they want for the five years that they're in office. And this is an abuse of public trust because it's public money that comes from everyone. So this is another aspect of representation and representative democracy. Uh, people have placed their trust in individuals to act in the public good for a period of time and they have to be accountable mm -hmm. and explain how they exercise that uh, mandate over the period that they've been elected to represent. Mm -hmm. And so should um, politicians only represent the views of those that, that are elected or that elected them to, you know, um, to the parliament? Yes, and I think this is a really important uh, question around integrity, and I know Mr. Pop will speak to that, uh, mm -hmm. because we have a law, the Organic Law for Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates, mm -hmm. that speaks to how people are supposed to actually consult um, with everyone, mm -hmm. and we have mechanisms like political parties that are supposed to provide that uh, avenue for engagement by citizens. Um, there's a common thing, and I know uh, your listeners, uh, those in speaking talk, this will be Plarimus and Pantilens and Togos and Rapami, the Kotim Molan and Maki Nitaso. On our plan, we simply know people are hungry and stuff. People stay hungry for the next five years. You didn't vote for me. Um, that's uh, actually an abuse of uh, a position by those that have been elected. Um, when you make a law, it doesn't only impact the people that voted you in, yeah. it impacts everyone. Absolutely. And when you spend public money, it does, it's not just the money that came from your supporters. It came from everyone that um, was in your electorate. Um, so that's one of those uh, perceptions that we have to challenge. And uh, to your listeners, those of you that will be going to the elections in the coming weeks, if you hear someone talking like that, or if you have that mentality that, look, I'm only voting someone that should look after my own interest and not everyone else's interest, that will only harm you in the long term. Mm. It's not for your long-term benefit. Because once they get uh, your vote and they disregard those of others, if your candidate doesn't go in, they'll dis disregard your vote. And then you end up suffering. So we have to make sure we have a representative democracy where actually your vote is meaningfully used and respected by those that uh, hold public office. Cool. All right. And uh, Mr. Park, uh, 
Um, how do political parties ensure integrity of representation? Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a very, very important question for our office. Um, since 2000 and, uh, 2003, up until 2012, the Registry of Political Parties have been working very hard to address the integrity part of the, the law, the Organic Law and the Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates. The law is for the political parties and the integrity of candidates. Uh, we've been working a lot with political parties, but since 2012, we've, we've, we've gathered the executives of political parties to address the integrity part of the law. Uh, you know, integrity is simply the quality of being honest and uh, having strong moral principles. Okay, because political parties, they endorse candidates uh, and they support them, since 2012, we have been working with political parties to, you know, endorse candidates with integrity, who are honest, who have high uh, moral principles, have good standing in the community, so it can, you know, well represent the political parties and the principles, the ideologies that the <coughs> political parties uh, represent, and also they come up to the national level and make good decisions because it's a good, well-grounded, uh, principle-oriented uh, Papua New Guineans. Uh, these are the things that we've been uh, working with political parties to uh, administer. Uh, since 2013, we've conducted a program called the Learning and Development Program for Political Parties. Uh, many political parties, they still lagging behind the, to uphold uh, integrity in, the, in their own uh, selection of candidates. Mm. Uh, because it affects the, you know, political parties are major players in the electoral process. So when they don't uphold or observe integrity in the, in the way they conduct their business, then it affects the uh, electoral process because they are major player, players in the process itself. So we've seen some positive uh, <coughs> outcome in the 2017 elections, mm -hmm. where we've seen you know, a number of uh, political parties contested and won seats in parliament, and also uh, a number of women candidates that uh, political parties have endorsed. So it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress, uh, uh, but still, uh, the integrity is integrity is a very important uh, ingredient of uh, a strong uh, leadership in this country. Mm. Mm. And uh, Mr. Verkic, mm. what are uh, challenges to political representation uh, in Papua New Guinea? So, I I think it depends who you are and where you're from. Frankly, we've touched on the challenges to women. I think there are a range of social and cultural attitudes that make it harder for women. And I think, um, you know, depending on, yeah. on your access to resources as well, yeah. wishing yeah. for your elections is not a cheap business anywhere, particularly in Papua New Guinea. It's interesting, we ran at UNDP, worked with IPCC in the parliament a week or two back and staged what we call a mock parliament. It's only women. And in the lead up to that, there was some training and really about building confidence around public speaking, but also understanding what it would be to run. And clearly there's an intent and a desire. And I think, you know, um, it's quite true, women's place is in the House, the House of Parliament. And I think accessing that's a really important thing, but also building a pathway towards it. But there's no doubt that uh, it's difficult for any political candidate to get headway. Touching on some of Emmanuel's points, the reality is, is that the path to election is not just about resources, but also understanding how to become registered, how to become a candidate, what that means. We talk about integrity. It's an interesting question, particularly around mandate and representation. 
and that ultimately a good representative does act in the interests of their electorate. And you think that that majority is being won because most people in that electorate feel that that representative that's received the highest number of votes is the best place to deliver on that mandate. I think the question of mandates is, a, is an interesting one as it comes to representation because we're not serving the, the, the entire mandate of the country. I'm sure if you asked lots of people about who they would like to lead or represent, we might get a very different parliament. But ultimately, this question of, of how you become a representative is a, is, a, is a tricky one. It requires depth and commitment. It's not easy. No. It's, there's a lot of knocks, there's a manual sure. no, and a lot of people will put their hand up and having the stamina to run a campaign is a difficult thing. Yeah, I think um, one of the other challenges of uh, representative uh, participation in our elections and in our government in Papua New Guinea is that, um, not to be crude, but most of the majority of our parliamentarians at the moment are going into elections have maybe primarily a business background. Uh, they might have been involved in business or been able to generate funds and then campaign on the back of that and then hold public office. If you have a representative democracy where most of the parliament is comprised of people that have business interests, then you might see more interest in terms of business in terms of decisions that are on business policies around business you get you know what you put into it in a democracy so if we have mostly business people going in then we'll have maybe decisions that are more geared towards promoting business or promoting obviously smes um, but then parliament needs to be more diverse so that we have diverse views and diverse processes because it's not, not only business that's discussed in parliament uh, it's education it's yeah. health we don't have any midwives in parliament we don't have anyone that's been a a nurse that can tell us that these are the challenges. We don't have anyone who's been uh, an IT professional maybe that can tell us that this is what the issues are. If we don't have those voices in Parliament and our Parliament is weaker for it, and we want to have as strong uh, views as possible in the floor of Parliament so that we have informed debate, if you just have the same voices then you'll have decisions that are only geared towards one direction and it's not for the benefit of the country. But that's another challenge to have. We might not have informed legislators debating on bills that are outside of maybe their particular interest. I think that's an important point. Yeah. So mm. The difference between a legislator, looking at a legislator, looking at a member of parliament as a legislator, not a service provider. Mm. The legislature has a very distinct job in a democracy. And there's a balance of powers, and there's also a separation of those powers between the executive arm of government, mm. the, the body that makes the laws, the parliament, and the judiciary, which reviews the integrity of those laws against the constitution fundamentally. Mm. But ultimately, that question of representation is not just about access, but also, as Emmanuel quite rightly says, the spread. Papua New Guinea is a very diverse society, but we don't necessarily see that diversity represented in our elected bodies. Mm -hmm. As we are having our discussion this morning around uh, political representation with uh, um, our Building Elections Integrity through Partnership Program number six uh, for this week, and uh, our guest with us, Mr. Emmanuel Park from. Um, OLIPAC Director, Policy and Legal Division, Mr. Edward Vekic, Deputy Resident Representative with UNDP, and Mr. Yuen Bari Haihule, uh, Deputy Director, Partnership and Policy, CIPNG. And uh, after these short messages, uh, we will continue on with more of uh, our discussion. On uh, Dubai this Friday morning, and the team from uh, TIPNG with our elections <coughs> program, <coughs> Building Integrity or rather building elections integrity um, through partnership program number six on political representation. Before we went for uh, the short break, uh, Mr. Vekic, you touched a bit on uh, women's um, representation leading into this part of our discussion. Leadership and politics is traditionally deemed a male-dominated arena. And so how will we increase national uh, PNG women's uh, civic and uh, uh, political participation. Over to you. First up, um, are women represented in Parliament in Papua New Guinea? Unfortunately not. I've said this earlier, there's, I think it's, at the moment there's only four countries that have no female representation in their national legislatures. Among them Vanuatu and Yemen. Um, PNG, it's, a, it's not a particularly nice place for Papua New Guinea to be, mm. particularly when you have a history of very strong women. And civic life and, and home and a uh, bastion of the family and, and public debate. The question about how we increase representation, the, the UN's position on, on special measures is, is very clear. We would like to see the reserve seats reserved for, for women candidates in Parliament. 
I know the only girl that done this quite successfully. And the, the, the argument for reserving seats or special seats as a temporary measure is that you build a public awareness of the importance of that representation yeah. in the national body. Um, there's various proposals around. Some would suggest up to 22 reserve seats. At the moment, we think um, the aspiration for five is a good place to start. But fundamentally, there's a few ingredients. One is we do think reserve seats are important as a temporary special measure because that builds awareness, but also offers an opportunity or a pathway toward parliament. And this idea that women can compete equally with men in an electoral landscape, we know is simply not true. I think the evidence would suggest that it's just not the way it is. Second is the it's the work of organisations like IPPCC and, and TI, and the UN and others, and our partners, the Australian governments and New Zealand and these others, and US, is to try and EU, is to try and lift the literacy among two groups of people, the general population, that actually, it's actually very important that you have more than just old, 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 old men and men <laughs> in the parliament. And the second is that, you start building literacy among political parties that actually a female candidate is a very viable option and is something that should be supported and endorsed. Ultimately, we want candidates to run on merit and ultimately we want the best people in the parliament. And it's not for us to say, well, you've got that at the moment. But what it is for us to say is that you're only drawing on 50% of the population. Imagine what you could do if you were drawing on 100% of the population. Imagine all the people, all those great minds out there, those passionate people, people that have got all these different lived experiences but are simply not feeding into that legislative process that Emmanuel was touching on earlier, which is about a collection. And the, the strongest countries and the strongest parliaments are the democratic parliaments with the broadest representation. We know that from international experience. And PNG is no example. You've had seven female candidates in your history mm -hmm. in parliament. Um, and some of those have been in more than once. Um, but what it does say to me is that there's a lot more work to be done, and that's it's, it's the job of all of us. There's a lot of heavy lifting, and it's too much for one one group to do. So there's a range of measures, Josephine, and I think um, we shouldn't forget that it's a it's a it's a campaign, you know, pardon the pun, but it's something that requires intergenerational commitment. It's something that requires changes in laws, improvements in access, greater equity of opportunity, which at the moment we're not quite seeing. And that, I would go so far as to say that includes youth, that includes people who are disabled, of course, who are from minorities. They're all part of Papua New Year's rich tapestry of, of life. Mm. Um, you know, getting them into the parliament makes the parliament even stronger. You know, I think I'm, that would be my, I think that's our position on this one. Mm. And so does uh, uh, the gender of an elected leader uh, or a representative matter? And uh, are we able also to draw from maybe, you know, um, another scenario, maybe another country, as to how important it is and, you know, it does matter? Well, I'll jump in quickly there because I'm not quite passionate about this. I think the proposition, I'll start by saying the proposition that your gender determines whether you're good or bad in Parliament mm. is absurd. I would argue that what matters is your integrity and the policies that you've brought to the Parliament, the platform you won your seat on, you know. Um, let's be really clear. We want to avoid personality politics at all costs. What's in the national interest is improving the literacy rate, which nationally is about 53%. You have more women dying in childbirth in Papua New Guinea than three times Sudan or Yemen, and they're both at war. Mm. So I mean, the, the bigger question is not just how do we get the best people, but how do we actually debate the policies that really matter to Papua New Guinea? There's incredible strengths and incredible resilience in Papua New Guinea, but there's also a lot of challenges. So the question about gender, I think we need to be very careful because if you say that, then you could say it about age, about your disability or your ethnic background or your want or your preferences. religious preferences, mm. it starts to become an absurdity and it detracts from the fundamental question, which is how do we get the strongest parliament to debate the issues of the day in the interest of the entire country? Mm. I just wanted to reiterate and support what Edward's saying there about um, the strength of our democracy. And you mentioned one of those... Um, Impediments. Uh, the, 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 it's not an equal playing field when it comes to the elections in our country. And uh, for TIPNG, um, we've been observing elections since 2007 and putting out reports, and we hope to do so again in 2022. Um, and one of those impediments, and I know Emmanuel's spoken with um, women at forums and got their views, but one of the views that TIPNG has had, and we've shared this at forums, 
is that we still see corruption as being one of those major impediments that you know stops it from being a level playing field um, whether that's in the corrupt practices by election officials or by candidates in 2017 for instance we had 200 elections related deaths in png that's almost two deaths per electorate that's a, a crazy price to pay for free fair and safe elections and it's those kind of things that limit people from wanting to freely participate if you if you feel that you have to engage in corrupt practices to win an election that already skews the board towards the favor of those that are engaging in corrupt practices and unfortunately it tends to be men who have accumulated wealth or social prestige that then use it to their benefit in terms of winning elections mm -hmm. um, but there, there's definitely a number of impediments and i know men who can speak to that but we see corruption as being one of them mm -hmm. And so, Mr. Mr. Park, why have women found it difficult to be elected, um, you know, uh, into uh, the uh, PNG um, Parliament? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I think we've been uh, working to address that question for some time now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as uh, Edward has said, we have recently. Uh, uh, completed the mock parliament with the woman potential wo woman candidates. We've been working with women leaders uh, since 2015 to address the issues that women are facing in terms of uh, you know contesting elections and uh, the problems they're facing in uh, the, the elections. Uh, first of all. Uh, I should say that at the registry's point of view, women leaders in Papua New Guinea are highly scrutinized. You know, they are easily intimidated during elections or before the elections when they have intentions to contest elections. Uh, you know, our, we have, of course, we have uh, cultural barriers, you know. Uh, Papua New Guinea is diverse and the way of doing things and seeing women uh, and men and their responsibilities, the division of labor and things like that is uh, different. But uh, in leadership, you know, it, leadership is a common ground. Women, of course, perform their leadership roles at different level and men to a different level in our societies. And, uh, you know, Papua New Guinea has grown out of this uh, cultural mentality where women's places in the kitchen and uh, election and something all month that's all mm -hmm. you know and finished because we have uh, already seven women uh, representing us in parliament yeah. and women have uh, contested elections whether the playing field is biased uneven uh, you know we've had a governor in the highland region uh, in Eastern Islands, uh, in uh, uh, former Governor Julie Soso. So the interest is there. It's just that, you know, corruption kicks in, our uh, cultural barriers, um, the electoral system is not even, you know, uh, we advocate about running a good elections, but at the eve of elections, they uh, polling uh, places are not gender friendly you know drug bodies take over um, you know aggressive aggression you know comes in at the last minute our security forces cannot do anything um, women are intimidated at the polling places they are not allowed to go and vote so these are some you know challenges that women face uh, but the interest is there. Women can win seats in Parliament. Uh, and I think the programs that we've run since 2016 have prepared women leaders well to contest elections. Uh, when the Registry of Political Parties saw that uh, the 22 reserve seats were self by Parliament, uh, you know, We've taken up that responsibility through political parties to legislate women's participation. You know, women's participation has to be legislated, as uh, Edward has said. 
we, you know, we cannot let the woman go out and compete like the system and the processes that we have now in the electoral system. We need to have a temporary a special measure for women's representation. And when we saw that uh, 12 research, uh, 22 researches <coughs> were self registered <coughs> political parties uh, in its revised organic law on the integrity of political parties and candidates, uh, addressed the issue through uh, the organic law that uh, we've inserted a section where uh, when uh, political parties and those candidates, 20% of the total number of candidates must be women candidates. You know, in there, political parties are taking up the responsibility so they can endorse them and support the women candidates. And uh, given our uh, voting system, the LPV, a uh, woman can have a better chance in uh, uh, winning elections in the country. And uh, in 2012, we saw three women candidates uh, in parliament. Uh, they were elected through the LPV system, and the second votes mattered a lot, mm -hmm. second and third, uh, in, the, in, in winning the seats in parliament. So we have uh, made a uh, Women candidates since 2000 and after the 2017 elections, uh, I think they are well grounded to contest the 2022 elections now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what were some of the lessons uh, learned from the women's forum hosted recently? And uh, you know, I will throw this out to uh, the three of you as uh, we continue on with our conversation. Um, because you know, I did um, you know have the privilege of attending also the mock parliament, mm -hmm. and you know I was blown away by you know the potential of you know you know what women have to offer given you know the opportunity, and so it would be good to hear from um, your various perspectives about uh, you know what you thought about uh, the recently held women's forum and of course the, the mock parliament session. Ooh. Thank you. Um, I think one very interesting thing is um, some of the women leaders did not know their potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, the mock parliament and the subsequent programs that led up to the mock parliament, you know, brought their potential, the leadership that they possess. Uh, you know, they, also their mindset were localized and in their own little communities, but when they were brought up, exposed to information, uh, exposed to what they can do, what they can contribute to the national level and given the opportunity to enter parliament and to debate on issues and things like that, you know, they've realized their potential, their abilities uh, and the, you know, strength that is in, built in them. So that was a good, good uh, uh, thing that came out from the uh, mock parliament. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd agree with Emmanuel. I think one of the, I dropped into a few sessions and uh, had the privilege of, of, of closing out. Uh, and you know, I think we should we should acknowledge all the stakeholders that were involved. It was an incredible feat. I think it's the third one we've had in the last few years. Um, in terms of a couple of things worth bearing in mind is that I think you're right. I think it's sort of this. Uh, it's like a, a very good point of advocacy, and you demonstrate by doing that it's possible. What was very uh, very rewarding for us was seeing, I guess, the the recognition among this this group of very competent, highly intelligent women that actually they could, that there really wasn't any impediment in terms of skills or ability. Yeah. The question about um, trialing debates, and, and there was actually a mock parliament which was set up like the, the floor of the house, and the clerk presided as the speaker and. We had people come in, it was quite formal, it was quite realistic. But what we found was this sense of debate and recognition and understanding and this, these moments of awakening where you start to understand what it is to be a legislator. And you have to start to understand what, what a ground looks like. And that, I think that, that amplifies, I guess, a much bigger challenge in Papua New Guinea is women in leadership. We don't have any provincial administrators that are women at the moment in the country. We don't have any members of parliament that are women. We have very few departmental secretaries that are women as well. 
So the more we can do to advocate, the more we can do to publicly demonstrate, the more we can do to shape the thinking of decision makers, to create those pathways that are more important, uh, and the more uh, more critical that becomes, but also the better it becomes in, in changing attitudes. And I think it all starts with attitudes and things like that. Oh, one of the critical things there is that, you know, walking in, the, the energy in that room is extraordinary. Um, and we shouldn't forget that uh, fundamentally, it's that question of representation, skills and exposure starts to build confidence and momentum. And I know with UNDP, we've been very active in supporting the coalition against gender bias. It is fundamentally an intergenerational commitment, and it's a broad-based commitment that requires resources and changing in attitudes. But at the end of the day, what it really brought home to me was that all the talent we need to strengthen the parliament is right there. It's in the community, and we don't have to look too far. You don't have to import ideas from anywhere else. You've got them all here. The solutions are in your country. They're right within. You know, it's just about allowing the opportunity for those solutions to come from within. Mm. At about seven minutes to uh, uh, ten o'clock, it is right now. We're on our um, building elections integrity through partnership program on uh, political representation, program number six, <coughs> and uh, um, very quickly also. What other groups need a better political representation? Uh, I'll take that one. <laughs> or I'll start. I think fundamentally we've talked about women, there's no doubt. I mean, ideally you'd have 50-50 in the House. 50% men, percent men, 50% women. I mean, that's if you want to talk about representation in its purest sense, that's the quota we should be aiming for. Um, look, it's certainly getting, getting the voice of younger people through the Parliament is critical. I go back to that statistic where there is an extraordinary youth bulge in Papua New Guinea, which is very, very, uh, if not managed properly, becomes a bit of a risk. We know that from research experience. And those people need a voice, you know, because they're helping to shape your society. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I think clearly disabled, you know, uh, minorities. There's a group of, of people. The composition of the parliament is, is kind of kind of similar to itself. We're kind of finding the same sorts of people now. So I would, I would argue that they're the three groups that we really need to work on. Mm -hmm. As uh, we are coming closer also, gentlemen, to the top of uh, the hour and the end of our programs, we have just five minutes to go, and so we will move into <coughs> the last bit of our conversation uh, to wrap up this morning's uh, talk on political representation and start with uh, uh, TIPNG. What is or makes a good leader and what are my MP's responsibilities is part of our talk. And so, um, Mr. Yobari, <coughs> what makes a good political representative? I think um, that's, a, that's a really pertinent question. It's a good one to, to end on for this session. And we've heard that we want to have, you know, uh, diverse representation, equal representation if possible. And the reason we want that is so that we can have views uh, adequately expressed and informed decision making by those that we've appointed to be decision makers. So looking at that question of what makes a good representative, uh, if you're representing someone, you need to make sure that you know what they think before you go and speak on their behalf. You can't just go and make it up on the spot and then go back and tell them. And what we see in our parliaments often is a lack of consultation. Um, MPs are given budgets to consult. They should have sessions between parliament where they go to their communities bring forth legislation, hear the views of their constituents, um, express um, those views to responsible agencies, um, and to make sure that that process of representation is actually uh, validated by the people that they represent. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the TIPNG promotes is having that uh, culture of servitude amongst our leaders. They have to be there to represent not just themselves or the people that put them into office, um, but as wide a representation of their population in the electorate as possible and um, they should also have this uh, spirit of accountability so being open about what they're doing the decisions that they made on behalf of their people um, when you represent someone you have to be able to tell them how you've represented them you can't go and disappear for five years and then come back and say please put me again as your representative um, if you send someone as your representative you want them to also uh, be open to your ideas so they should be able to be there to um, solicit collect consolidate and then share those views effectively. It's a difficult job, you know, 
and we should have people that go into that office that are fit and proper and able to do that consultative and representative function and that we've appointed them because at the end of the day they decide how our money is spent, what laws we are bound by and how the future of our country will look like in that term of office. So it's not a light uh, duty and we shouldn't have people going into office that think that they won the lottery and are suddenly kings or queens for five years. That shouldn't be the attitude. It should be an attitude of service and of representation. Mm. And uh, finally, as we do wrap up our conversation to Mr. Berkic and uh, um, also to Mr. Porter, how does better political representation lead to better development outcomes for Papua New Guinea? So I was saying, Emmanuel, I think you've just written the terms of reference for future MPs right there. It's a, it's a nice way of putting it. Um, look, I think the the question of national development is one that affects everyone. Cool. And the not everyone will want the same things, and not everyone will believe that the same things are the right way to, to proceed on that national development. But fundamentally, the question of experience, not just in terms of your your resume, but also your life experience, is, is critical. Coming from different social and economic backgrounds is critical. And I think the, there's no higher or greater question of national interest than the future development of Papua New Guinea. And at the centre of that is how do you make it more equitable? How do you ensure that no one is left behind? If you're only talking to a small portion of your society about that question, unfortunately, you're going to end up leaving people behind. You won't see them, they have no voice. They don't influence the thinking. And I think fundamentally, any public debate can only be richer if you have more interest involved in that debate. And the parliament can only be stronger if you have broader representation because the breadth of the parliament will determine the issues that are debated. And that is a very important point when it comes to national development. And uh, finally, Mr. Pop, to uh, wrap up our conversation this morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, our elected representatives uh, uh, they have the responsibility, responsibility to be accountable to the people who have elected them. And that's very important. Uh, they must safeguard the interest of the people who have elected them, whether it be, you know, public policy making, laws, making laws or debating laws, they must always have the people's uh, interest to be protected. So they have this legal responsibility where uh, they are accountable to the people who have elected them. As uh, Edward has said, they represent the people and they're there for the people and they've been they will be there, they are there by the people. So that's very important uh, an elected representative should uh, know. And there you have it. As we have uh, run out of time, we've come to the top of the hour, and so we will have to leave that conversation there. But gentlemen, thank you so much for your time with us this morning on our program number six of uh, Building Integrity, Building Elections, rather, Integrity is through Partnership Program. Uh, on uh, political representation this week and our guests Mr. Emmanuel Pork, Director of Policy and Legal Division Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates Commission, Mr. Edward Rekic, Deputy Resident Representative UNDP and Mr. Ewan Barry Haihuhe, Deputy Director of Partnerships and Policy TIPNG. You are listening to NBC Radio, Real PNG on 90.7 FM and 585 AM. It's time for the news. 10 o'clock.